So once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for tonight's APRA AMCOS Insight Session to better understand your royalties. I would uh, like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land from which I'm joining you, and that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to extend that welcome and acknowledgement to any First Nations callers that we may have joining us tonight and extend it to our cousins and Aotearoa and say kia ora to them. Thank you for being with us as well. Uh, this evening, we are joined, well, I am joined, my name is Nikki Tuckwell and I work at APRA AMCOS in the Writer Services Department. I'm joined by my colleague, Caroline McKnight, and our special guest presenter this evening is the Director of Distribution at APRA AMCOS, Derek Cameron, is here with us. Before we kick off, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. You'll notice that the chat is disabled because we are in webinar mode, but you do have a Q&A facility. So throughout tonight's webinar, if you have any questions about what Derek is saying, the, the types of things that we're talking about, please feel free to pop your questions straight into that Q&A facility. I would suggest holding off for a little bit of time because Derek may actually cover off on some of the topics that um, you wanted to question. So give it a bit of time to see if the information is included. But of course, if anything isn't clear, the question and answer facility is there for you. The other thing that we would ask is please don't ask about your own specific situations. I would say 100% of the time, uh, a royalty question requires quite in-depth consideration. We need to look into specific writers' accounts and things like that and possibly follow trails even all around the world. So please try and keep the, the questions general rather than pertaining to your own situations. I will mention two other insights webinars we have on the calendar for you. The next one actually is quite fitting. Following this is going to be on June the 13th, and that's our top tax time tips. So once you understand what you've been paid for and how to view your royalty statements, the tax time tips will help you claim uh, and make sure you get back any tax that you're owed from the ATO. And then we have the one following that is going to be on the 27th of June. That's the launch of a legal pack. So it's a pack that's been put together to help you with any contracts and agreements that you might be either have offered to you or you might be looking to uh, draw up yourself, band agreements, studio agreements, all kinds of things. But that is far and away enough from me. I am going to hand over to Derek. Caroline and I will go cameras off, but we will be in the background doing the Q&A. So Derek, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Over to you. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I hope everybody is well. Um, so yeah, I will be um, going through a few um, of the topics that we deal with uh, when calculating royalty payments and making royalty distributions. Um, before we get into that, I feel as though it's probably appropriate for me to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so yes, my name is Derek Cameron. Um, I am of the Cameron clan from um, Scotland. So my ancestors came from the Scottish Highlands um, many generations ago, moved to Australia and um, were first, you know, arrived on Bundjalung country, which is in northern rivers of New South Wales. Um, and then, you know, some of my um, family moved down to Darawal country. So I went to school, I was born and raised in um, the St. George and Sutherland Shire area of Sydney, the, where the Darawal people are from. And then when I left school, moved into the inner west, into onto Gadigal land, and have been living and working on Gadigal land ever since. Um, at that time, I uh, took up you know, music and playing in bands, playing the guitar and also the less well celebrated but equally important bass guitar and um, became an APRA member at that time. So my first interaction with APRA was as a member and, um, you know, getting paid for live performance royalties and things across the years and, um, you know, went through my studies and um, ended up employed at APRA and have worked in the royalty distributions department uh, since 2011, so 13 years 
and a bit. Um, so I'm not the new guy anymore um, and have been the uh, director of royalty distribution since 2018. Um, so I wanted to go through a few different topics today. Um, firstly, uh, doing some, you know, a general overview of um, royalty distribution. So where the money comes from and how it ends up in a distribution timeline, um, how we, you know, some of the high level um, calculations that go on in order to determine a royalty value for a work. And then looking at a few different um, areas where we, distribute um, live performance royalties, royalties owned by radio performances or broadcasts and um, streaming. And we'll move on to other items at the end. And then, um, you know, if any questions have come through the q and I'm sure that uh, Nikki and Caroline will be happy to um, share them with us and we can address any questions that have come up at the end. Um, so the first uh, couple of slides here are really just a high level view of the sort of um, ecosystem that we're in, starting with bringing money into the um, business, which comes from, you know, One Music or APRA Amcos clients. Uh, when we talk about clients, we're really talking about any businesses that are using music in their professional context. And that could be uh, from, you know, Spotify or Apple having music um, on a streaming service and then selling subscriptions, or it could be television or radio where they use featured and background music as well as music and advertising as part of their broadcast as well or, um, you know, retail stores, um, you know, uh, hospitality venues, restaurants, bars, or whatever that have music on in the background. They may have, um, you know, a nightclub or live performance. So anyone who's running a business where music is being used as part of that um, business, they have to take out a license. So they're covered for the copyright in that music. And so that we can then, you know, distribute royalties uh, to the composers and publishers whose music is being used. Um, so we have, you know, teams that are constantly in contact with businesses who are using music commercially. So they have the right license, they're paying the right license fees, and then those license fees can come through and we can um, determine what's the best way to get those license fees out to the writers and publishers who have composed the music that is being used. Um, so as part of that service, number two there, we collect music data from various sources. Um, we have a, a wide range of music data collection practices uh, because there's a wide range of you know ways in which people use music so the um, you know streaming services would report to us directly the list of works that have been streamed and how many times within the quarter um, radio stations and TV um, have their own uh, systems which log all of the uh, television programs films or um, you know, songs that are broadcast to their playlists. So they can provide us um, with digital files that have the um, those playlists. Uh, with community radio, there's also various ways of collecting data from community radio. Uh, we also use uh, music recognition technology. Uh, so, you know, um, hardware that can identify music and can bounce that via a global database and send us back, um, you know, auto matched, you know, like Shazam type technology that allows us to um, be able to get, you know, instant recognition of music that is in certain venues, nightclubs or, um, you know, retail stores or uh, restaurants. Um, and we also have, you know, uh, background music suppliers who supply music to stores can also give us their playlists. And there are a few other things as well. So there's uh, quite a variety of different sources of, um, you know, music usage data that is uh, collected by APRA AMCOS. And it's always a fun challenge to be able to try and standardize all of those into a system that we can then use in order to calculate royalties. Um, so that once we have standardized that data and been able to load it into our um, system, then of course we have to match that to the songs and compositions in our database. So, you know, everyone, you know, when you write a new song and you register it um, via the website, uh, we, we get that record there. And so when we do um, have you know, broadcast data or whatever it is, um, we go through the process of matching that uh, so that we can make sure that we can then identify who the writers and publishers of the song are so that we can then, you know, once we have calculated a royalty value for the song, we can then, you know, pass that on to the, the people who contributed to writing the song. Um, so number four there is calculating royalties. We do have uh, different calculation methods for different types of data. Um, so, you know, um, you know, streaming data is similar, but fundamentally different to radio broadcast, for example. So there are some uh, differences in the way that we calculate um, the royalties for each of those 
um, songs based on how they were used and how the data was reported to us. And then, um, you know, obviously what, what it all culminates is what we're here to do is pay royalties to uh, the songwriters and their publishers, and whether that's Australian or New Zealand songwriters who are members of APRA, or whether we've recognised songs that were written by um, members of affiliate societies. So um, we may be paying the money over to our affiliates in Europe or the UK or the USA uh, to pass on to the, you know, the Paul McCartney's and the Drakes of this world and so on, um, who may have written the songs that were, you know, broadcast. I don't know why I chose those two. It just came to me. Um, so moving on to uh, this rather colourful slide, it, it's a way of attempting to visualise the general timeline. This is there are exceptions to um, this timeline, but this should just give you an idea um, of you know the way that um, we work through um, you know activity taking place, the data being provided to APRA AMCOS, and the processing taking place, culminating in our being able to pay royalties to people. Um, so you know some of you may have just received a, a royalty payment this week for what would have been referred to as P2404. Um, as you can see there, that's the, I can't remember what we call it, hot pink. Um, I'm sure it has a, a name that the communications department will get angry at me for not quoting, but they won't really get angry, I'm sure. Um, but what you can see there is, so the, the, the payment happened in May, as you can see is aligned with May there. That was mostly processed in January, February, March, and then leading into an um, April processing um, payment cutoff. Um, and that relates back to activity that happened in October, November, and December. So the, the payments that we're making now uh, for particularly for the the, um, the larger sectors like the digital and television and radio that we're paying out the broadcasts and streams that occurred in October November and December of last year and um, you yeah, know moving forward we will then move into the the next quarterly distribution which we're currently processing so that'll go out in August and will relate back to the um, January February and March um, broadcasts and um, you know in the spirit of improving things, we're always looking for um, ways to try and compress that down. But at the moment, this is the timeline to which we work where we have, you know, activity occurring, we have to wait until the end of the quarter before the, you know, usages can get reported to us. So then we spend a, a couple of months getting those reports in, loading them into the system, making sure the matching is correct, making sure we know who wrote the songs, who their publishers are, looking at all of the different registrations we've received, and then, you know, moving into payments. Um, so that is, and there are some significant um, exceptions to that, because obviously um, this relates to ongoing licenses um, that need to be processed altogether. Um, for live performances, they're you know much more sort of um, haphazard occurrences or you know event by event. Um, so we don't necessarily, if if an event occurred in March, um, we wouldn't necessarily have to wait until you know the. Uh, August distribution, we may be able to pay that out in May if we actually have the, the set lists that are associated with the event. Um, but then if we don't have the set lists, you know, a March performance may end up going out into November. So it, sometimes it depends on, you know, can we get everything we need all in time? Um, you know, whereas, yeah, as I say, the big sectors relate to these um, processing timelines. And just moving on now, I hope that everyone has enough time to take all this stuff in. Uh, I'm sure I can provide more um, information at a later time if there are questions, but um, just trying to visualize here um, the way that music use data and businesses license fees are brought together in order to um, culminate in a royalty payment to a particular writer. Um, so yeah, two independent um, processes really. One is the collection of music use data, radio playlists, streaming services, um, you know, stream reports, event set lists, as the case may be. Um, we take that information and then we um, we have to calculate calculate a relative value, um, and we usually use uh, one or two metrics that have been reported to us. So in the case of um, you know radio broadcasts, we would use the duration. So a very long duration uh, song may end up um, you know, attracting a higher royalty than something that had a very short duration broadcast, um, you know, as opposed to streaming services where we don't get the duration, um, we only have the number of streams, and therefore it's the number of streams that are used to create credits, and that gives us a standardized and relative value for all of the songs that we are processing. Um, on the other side, we've got the license fees in, so we then need to allocate those to different pools. Um, 
basically just breaking up the money so that it can be um, you know distributed against the correct data set. So um, where we may have um, you know Spotify have given us their license fees. We have a few different reports from Spotify, so we need to split the money up into different um, pools so that we can allocate them to the different license fees. Alternatively, we may have you know license fees coming in from you know tens of thousands of retail stores, and we need to put all of that together um, in order to be able to distribute that to the um, music that we know is being played in retail stores or you know various types of retail stores. So once we've done that, we can then put the two together. So we have calculated a relative value for all of the different songs and we've also calculated a dollar value for the pool so that we can then uh, calculate a value per work using those relative values that we calculated as points and then you know determine who the um, writers and composers and publishers are who contributed or have some copyright in those songs so we've got a value per work we can then distribute that as royalties uh, to the different um, writers or lyricists or publishers who've made a contribution or currently hold the rights. And, um, and then those pay payments can go out and we can produce statements and um, that can go onto the portal or be sent to our affiliates or publishers as the case may be. Um, so again, there are exceptions um, in some cases, but this is a, a good general high level description of how we might put together uh, music use, playlist data and license fee data in order to be able to um, make create royalty payments um, to be distributed to songwriters. Um, so moving on now to a couple of different specific spheres. Um, firstly, I wanted to focus on live performance royalties. Um, you know, obviously having been a musician myself, I know that, you know, the excitement of live performance, that's really where you're generally, you know, looking to, you know, practice your craft really. Um, you know, live performance is, you know, it's an extraordinary amount of fun when it goes right and is also you know really the the backbone of a lot of people's um you know musical focus um when we talk about live performance royalties you know it generally gets um dealt with in one of two different ways so we could have promoted events which tend to be larger events um, with ticket prices uh, and it may be venues that are not covered by an ongoing performance license um so a lot of times these are going to be a tours where they're on in, you know, theaters or arenas. It might be a festival would be considered as a promoted event. Um, or it might be, you know, a stage at, um, you know, a Vivid or something like that, um, where they are set up as uh, one-off single occurrence performances. Um, or, you know, performances at sporting events, those sorts of things. Um, those are paid directly. So we can, because we're um, charging a particular license for a particular event, and then we're getting set lists specifically for the, um, the songs that were played at that particular event, we can do a very, very um, discreet, close distribution. So, um, you know, when, you know, Taylor Swift is here, for example, you know, every night that she played, um, there was a particular invoice or license for that particular night. And then, um, you know, Taylor personally, I think, sent us uh, copies of all of uh, the set lists that she played. And then we were able to put that into our system. And there was a direct relationship between the, um, the license that was, um, you know, calculated for that night and the songs that were performed on that night. Um, when collecting set lists, uh, we generally have to go through quite a a process. Um, in some cases, um, you know, it's relatively straightforward to get the set list because, you know, people that are performing or the artists or their managers tend to know, you know, providing a set list means that they will then be able to earn their royalties. So um, that is, you know, when, you know, best possible scenario is that it is um, a relatively straightforward thing. But I also acknowledge it is definitely a bit more admin. And um, when you're in the middle of a tour or, you know, going from event to event, extra admin is probably not really what you're after. Um, so, so sometimes it, it does require a little bit of chasing. Um, and we also we have various uh, avenues. So the, the promoter who's put, putting on the event, um, you know, does have a requirement to provide set list data to associated with the event. Um, we also may uh, contact artists or their management teams. Um, our affiliate societies are also sometimes quite good at um, providing us with set lists. 
Um, some music publishers are also able to um, provide set lists as well. And then, you know, if we can't find that, you know, there is always, a, um, you know, the, the last resort of um, looking at a crowdsource set lists or videos or whatever we can find just in order to make sure we have accurate data so that we're making the most accurate distribution payments that we can. And um, we have just moved into a um, regular monthly distribution for promoted events. So um, where we do have an invoice raised for a particular event and that has been paid and we have all the set lists, we will make that distribution in the next month after that. So um, we are looking to increase the frequency of our distribution payments starting with these promoted events. Um, the other type of live performance royalties that we calculate and pay out are performance reports. Um, I presume that most people are familiar with this. I certainly was before I got the job at APRA. Um, it is you know, where our um, members are self-reporting, where they're um, performing. So you've, you know, you um, have you know, booked a venue, well, I'm sorry, booked a gig at a venue. It's an ongoing venue, you know, whatever the, the case may be, you know, the, the lands down not too far from where we are here, for example, might have a, an ongoing license. So they have a license that allows them to put on live music, you know, whenever they uh, want to book it. And then um, when you get a gig at the, um, the lands down, then you would submit the live performance report and um, we would get that and bring that into the system and make the payment in the next quarterly distribution. Um, <laughs> we have standardized payment rates for those. So there's no, um, uh, there is no necessarily correlation between the license fee paid by the venue and the number of performances that we get from that venue. It's, it's more of a um, generic payment um, plan and um, yeah, relies on self uh, reporting from our members. Hmm. Uh, moving on to a view of radio. Again, three different radio sectors. Um, so we have commercial radio. Um, these are the obviously the larger stations. Um, you sort of triple M today FM. Does that still exist? Probably not. Smooth. Those sorts of things. Um, those are paid directly. Again, similar to the events, <coughs> we have. Um, licenses in place with all of those radio stations. The license fee will be calculated based on the you know, radio station's revenue and the amount of music that they use. So, um, you know, Triple M, for example, you know, make a lot of money, they um, sell a lot of ads, and so there's, they're a higher revenue station. So they'd be paying more uh, in licenses to, to cover the copyright in the songs that they broadcast which means we can then pay out um, triple M broadcasts at a higher rate. Um, they also provide directly uh, the playlist information from their systems. So we're able to get very accurate information about what was broadcast on each commercial radio station. Um, probably the highest rates we see are probably um, <laughs> with the sports talk commercial stations because, um, you know, you know, Aussies, we love to talk about football. We love to hear people talking about football. So the commercial radio stations that have a lot of sports talk tend to be you know, quite high revenue um, and probably play a little bit less music. So you get higher payout rates there. Um, and then, you know, obviously there are a sliding scale. Um, but again, all commercial radio stations provide us with playlists and we uh, process all of those. So that there is that direct correlation between the radio broadcaster, and the fees that they're paying to cover the use of copyright music and then the music that they're actually playing and then providing us with playlists. Um, we also distribute to the jingles that are broadcast so that um, advertisements or um, songs that have been synced into ads. Um, we have a music recognition technology partner who provides us with that information. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's like a sort of Shazam type technology. So when the ads are on as part of the broadcast, um, the, a recording is made and then that's matched against a particular database and it comes back telling us, um, you know, uh, title and performer and um, some other metadata and we're able to put that into our system so that we can then distribute royalties uh, to the music that's played in um, advertisements or jingles. Um, and again, all of that is um, all, all of our radio distributions at the moment are made on a quarterly basis. So um, this goes back to the colorful timeline that I had up earlier where um, the you know, broadcasts which happened in October to December last year 
all of these reports came through to us at the beginning of this year and were processed. And then um, we've picked up the license fees appropriate to that period and they're being paid out um, this month. Um, we also have national broadcasters, by which I mean the sort of national government funded, so ABC and SBS really. Um, ABC and SBS both pay us an annual fee for all of the music used on all of their, you know, their whole ecosystem. So we have to then, you know, a share of that will go to radio, another share will go to um, TV. Um, so for, we then have to, you know, determine how that goes across the different stations. Um, you know, the majority would be going to, you know, the more music heavy, so Triple J, Double J and um, Classic FM. Although Classic FM has a bit of um, out of copyright material. Um, so yeah, most significantly with the ABC, we'd be looking at Triple J, Double J. Um, but then we also do get, you know, some of the other um, ABC stations with um, Kids Listen. So um, all of that is reported through to us. And then you know, again, we bring that into our system, use the, the uh, songs that were broadcast and the duration of that broadcast in order to be able to create a relative value. And then we can um, distribute money to the, um, to all of those songs and the writers of those songs. And um, yeah, similar story with SBS, um, you know, obviously different sets of data because SBS radio is not quite the same as um, ABC radio, but it follows basically the same practice where we're getting information about their, um, the broadcasts that go out um, via SBS and um, to their national services and um, allocating a dollar value and um, being able to distribute to the writers and publishers of the songs that have been broadcast on SBS radio. Um, and again, all of that is provided by directly by the station. So they have playlisting systems that keep a log of everything that has been um, played so that we can get that um, into our systems and um, you know, relatively efficiently um, bring that into the system, match it to the right works and make sure that we pay it. Um, another interesting fact, and this is, I'm just going off a little bit of a tangent here. I hope that's okay. But um, we also look um, at, the local content. Um, that's a conversation that we're constantly a part of, um, you know, and it's it's an important thing for for everybody involved, of course, because you know we are, you know, in Australia, Australia and New Zealand, you know, it is in everyone's best interest to try and promote, you know, the value of Australian music, um, and you know, celebrate that really. So, um, commercial radio stations have a local content quota, so um, all commercial radio stations. You know, depending on the type of station that they are, um, will have a different obligation to a percentage of their um, playlists that have to be you know local. Um, and again, I know I've picked out Triple M a number of times. They you know they've come up. Anyway, they are I would just call out quite good. Their local content is um you know really quite high. Um, maybe offset a little by the fact that they don't really pursue new releases. So a lot of it is you know in excess and midnight oil. But nevertheless, they do certainly go above and beyond their obligation to play local content as opposed to some other stations who are, um, you know, seem to drag their feet a little bit. Um, Triple J, I'm sure you'd all be able to guess, um, you know, goes above and beyond as well. They, they quite um, celebrate Australian music and, you know, they invest in it a lot. So there's a lot of much higher local content on Triple J. And um, the other type of radio that we process, um, you know, like roughly grouped is community radio. A um, bit of a different um, situation for community radio, really, because they don't have the same resources and therefore the same access to technology as some of those biggest broadcasters, which means uh, it's much more difficult for them to be able to provide us with um, playlist data. It's you know much easier for a, a Triple J or whatever to you know just get a log of everything that was broadcast and provide that to us, and we can ingest that into our system. Whereas community radio is often run by you know volunteers, and um, you know every different show has a different producer. They all do things in different ways. It's um, they don't have admin managers a lot of the time, and so um, we've looked at different ways that we can make uh, the community radio data that we have uh, as wide as possible. Um, so we have historically we have asked. Uh, um, community radio stations to provide us with um, some reporting um, and obviously some found it easier than others but yeah we all, um, there was a lot of you know handwritten things where a particular producer or someone running a particular show would you know you know dedicate time to writing down all of the songs that they were playing who wrote them who the band was information about the recording and sending that to us 
um, which is, you know, it's fantastic information to have, but it's really onerous. It's a lot of admin heavy work for someone who's not really getting much out of it and maybe a volunteer. Um, so we've been looking for ways to improve that. Um, AMRAP pages is, um, via the AMRAP website is um, another thing that community radio stations sometimes do, which is they can provide uh, their playlists, um, which can then be added to AMRAP pages so that people can go online and see the playlists associated with particular shows. So AMRAP was able to give us a copy of their AMRAP pages. So we were able to start collecting uh, more widely um, some of the music that was played on some of those radio stations. But um, yeah, there are, you know, again, stations have different approaches to that, but that really allowed us to see, you know, particularly some of the bigger, you know, FBI, Triple R, those sorts of, um, you know, more, um, you know, dedicated um, music, uh, community radio um, broadcasters were able to give us, you know, um, via AMRAP, uh, a, a much larger section of what they were playing. And we have also started implementing a different type of music recognition technology there as well. Um, at the moment, we are getting some um, automatically matched um, community radio network data. So a lot of shows that are syndicated for different community radio broadcasters throughout Australia, we're able to get auto recognition of those. And we are, I hope I'm not um, you know, revealing anything too much here or um, going above my station, but we are looking at rolling out music recognition technology much more widely across the full community broadcasting ecosystem. So um, hopefully we will continue to see improvements in that regard um, and we'll be able to pay out uh, much more accurately on a much broader range of um, songs that are broadcast and music that is broadcast on community radio. Um, that is offset by the fact that community radio there's not a huge amount of money coming from that sector. Um, and um, so at the moment we have standardized payment rates so that the um, different stations um, are able to be combined and standardized. Um, you know, the, the more broadly we expand the scope of our um, technology, effectively that means that there'll be, you know, more songs being played, but they'll have to be played at a, paid at a slightly uh, lower rate. So we're looking at um, how we balance that at the moment, but um, definitely the community radio sector is one that we look at as being very important. We spend quite a bit of time making sure that we are making improvements and um, doing the right thing as far as community radio goes, because it is um, you know, definitely an important stepping stone for a lot of people who um, you know, are you know, practicing their craft and find that um, community radio stations might support them um, you know, in an earlier stage of their career, definitely, than um, you know, some of the more corporate um, setups. So yeah, community radio is um, something that we've been investing in for a while and will continue to. Um, moving on to streaming royalties. Um, there's a lot of content online. Uh, there's no question about that. And it's being used in so, such a variety of ways. So it's, um, it's difficult to, or, you know, go into the extremely, you know, to the details of every single you know way that music is used online um, and i'm sure that everyone is really you know curious and, and keen to know as much as they can about this so i'm um, this is relatively high level but for me this um is a good way to approach the you know the to categorize the main ways that music is used in online services um and that i mean for me is you looking at two different types of you know broadly categorized services which is dedicated streaming services where you've got Apple, Spotify, and there are a few others, uh, of course, but Apple and Spotify are the big ones where it's all about selling a subscription so that people can stream music. They're putting together playlists, you're following playlists or sharing playlists. Um, you know, it is where you find new releases, you can listen to albums. It's all about being a dedicated music service. Um, and, you know, you, you know, can see, you know, lyrics, you can find out more about the artists. Uh, it can give you, you know, headlines about new releases that you might like or um, tours that you might be interested in. It is a music streaming service. Um, and from those uh, services, we do receive direct reports um, on a tier by tier basis. So um, yeah, there's you know, the premium individual subscriber tier. There might also be a family or multi-user tier, uh, uh, discounted rate for students. So you got your student tier, um, you know, ad supported. So 
Spotify has a free service which plays ads. So they report to us the usage under all of those different tiers. And um, we are then able to do direct distribution so that the, um, the revenue that has come in for the people you know, on the student um, tier, we can distribute that to the music that was played by people who had logged in using that um, student subscription. Um, as opposed to, you know, if you've got a family or a couple who are on the same plan and therefore they're, um, they're paying the rate for their family plan, we get a report about the music that is used under the family plan and we can do a direct distribution for, of those, the, the money that's come in related to those users and pay it to the music that they listen to. Um, and then you've got social media and user generated content. This is a much more sort of wild west of how music is being used really. Um, so YouTube, which is, you know, everything to everybody really, uh, Facebook and Instagram, so the metaverse, um, they tried to get that going a few years ago. I don't know if it really took on, but yeah, Facebook and Instagram, um, TikTok as well. And, you know, if you've had an ear to the ground, you know that there's been a little bit of a, um, you know, difficulty with TikTok and music licensing and particularly, um, you know, a couple of the publishers looking at the way that TikTok have, um, you know, dragged their feet a little bit on, um, you know, taking out appropriate licenses. So, I mean, some of these services are actually really good. They recognize the value of copyright they recognize that they should be paying for the music particularly apple and spotify i know that they've you know there are um you know various stories and people have various opinions but they certainly um recognize the fact that they need to take a license that they are using music and that that music does have copyright owners that writers and composers um certainly have contributed to the uh, products that they're selling and therefore um they you know are you know quite forthcoming in taking out licenses tiktok on the other hand sort of has been more difficult to deal with and you've seen that in the media you know the um quite publicized stout with universal music publishing and um yeah different stories um we still do get um usage reports uh, youtube give us quite granly, granular usage reports about all of the different videos and all of the different um you know a lot of the the um, musical content and the, the um the videos have music ids in a lot of cases uh, which assists us in matching um, uh, they also have you know, various general use videos and things. Um, Facebook and Instagram have a few different ways of um, reporting music to us. So anytime that music is used in videos or reels or stories, um, there's a, there are records of those. They've also got a, um, a music matching service so they can, they can also um, give us information about um, music that was used in videos that were shared on their services on um, you know, just the... Um, general streams so or um you know news feeds those sorts of things so uh, we get yeah a variety of reports um regarding music used on youtube facebook instagram and tiktok and other services like that again the, those are the big ones there are um quite a few others that are out there that are also you know they have licenses they pay their licenses and, and provide us with um streaming reports or music usage reports and um yeah again we take the um, license fees that are being paid to us by those services, Google, Meta, whoever, and then, um, you know, allocate those down to the different playlists or data sets that they've provided. And then we can, you know, give each work a uh, relative value and um, pay the money out to the writers, composers and publishers. Um, and that is, I mean, you know, we are now in a situation where, you know, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So I think, you know, um, the, the number of songs that are reported to us and the, the number of streams that are reported to us just, you know, every year that seems to be, you know, massively increasing. And so we're just constantly running these big files in um, making sure that, um, you know, as much as possible, we're capturing everything that's been reported to us and using that in order to make distribution payments. Um, so at this stage, I have come to the end of the prepared content. Um, I could go on, but um, I have a feeling that it would be better at this stage to start um, taking some guidance or you know, um, handing the floor back to Nikki or Caroline if there are any questions. Thank you, Derek. That's great. Uh, yes, I think Nikki and I, we've got some, we've got some questions. Um, yeah. That was great. So much content. Thank you. Um, we've got I hope it some. Wasn't too much. 
No, not at all. Well, there's so much to cover and I and I think it's really nice to kind of, you're sort of throwing a lot of information at people, but everyone's understanding it and everyone's coming through with a lot of questions. There's a few that we've uh, tagged to maybe have a chat about and answer live. Nikki, do you want to take over a bit and run oh, through some of those? I absolutely do. So, Derek, please be ready. These are all over the place. I mean, they're all about royalties, but otherwise... <laughs> Okay. Well, so. I'll do what I can to answer. And <laughs> I'll, if there, are, I'm also happy to take anything on notice. So if there is anything and I need to go and look things up and come back, um, I'd be happy to do that as well. So, you know, happy to make sure that if people have any questions or whatever, we'll, we'll make sure we get you the answer. Amazing. I think you're going to know though. Oh, you know, but okay, let's just start with this first one here because I wasn't sure if we would get to it. Um, it has to do with the processing and payment timeline for mm -hmm. payments coming in from overseas. So, for example, something from Europe. Yes. So what would we be looking at as a, perform a, a writer whose work has been performed, let's say a commercial radio station in Europe, just to keep it simple? Right. Um, that does open itself up to a few more variables. So pretty much all of the various collecting societies in Europe, and there are a variety, there, you know, there, there's one for each country basically, um, which means that, you know, being played in Europe means, um, you know, a lot of different um, hands are involved, I suppose. Um, and all of the different European societies have their own timelines and their own way of processing things. So um, if you've been, if, if your work, if your songs have been broadcast in England or in the United Kingdom, then that would be collected by PRS, uh, who are the um, UK society. PRS have a very similar timeline processing to ourselves. So um, you would be looking at, again, um, things, you know, the broadcasts that happened in the December quarter last year, October, October, November, December, they would then be processed by PRS in the first few months of this year and then paid to us round about this time. Um, so, you know, April, May. Um, we would then pay that out, that out within the next three months. So um, if your song was on radio in, um, on the BBC or whatever, um, then, yeah, we would be receiving the payment from England or from PRS uh, roughly about now. And then we'd be... Um, you know, paying that out within the next three months. Um, but, sorry, not by, And due to the variety of cultures in, um, in Europe and the, the resources that are allocated, there's not always the same processing timelines. So um, the Swedish society, for example, um, do two broadcast distributions a year. So um, the Swedish society, STIM, um, would pay i'm not quite sure they may do a, a six monthly distribution which would come to us sort of roughly now um which means if you if your stuff was played in sweden then you might get the payment now or within the next few months after we've processed it but then if your stuff was played in sweden in january uh, we may not receive that until the end of this year because that would fall into their sort of january to june period um so that um that would mean that Sweden, for example, it might take a little bit longer for us to get um, the payment. And then um, because of the, the nature of the different cultures and different languages and therefore, you know, character sets and things, uh, there are some files that take us a little bit longer to process as well. So, um, you know, we, we always try to prioritize the, the major distributions that come into us. Um, but then there are some others that not only is there a delay in getting them to us, but then um, the, the processing takes longer as we have to convert the file formats. And so another area that we are always looking for continuous improvement, and I've had you know, a couple of conversations just this very day um, about ways in which we can reduce the lag in you know, the distribution being received by us and then being paid onto our writers, uh, because I know that there's you know, definitely um, improvements that we can make in that regard and we're definitely taking steps to make sure that we we do find the most efficient way to get that money out to people because you know when you've particularly you know if you if you have had to wait for a longer time because the germans or the swedes or the spaniards or whoever it is have a longer processing um you know timeline built into their systems then you know we really want to um, reduce the extra processing that happens between us getting it and us paying it on so um yeah, a couple of different variables, but certainly, um, you know, for us, 
to receive the payment can take a longer time. Yeah, I think we would always advise as, as a right of services rep, we would have always said at least nine, but probably 12 months would be the kind of expected turnaround. And if you start, if it starts getting too much longer than that, then reach out and we'll, we'll yeah. look into things. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, we do, um, obviously, sorry, we, we do also have um, people who are dedicated to trying to make sure we are maximizing that as well. So there are people at APRA AMCOS who are constantly in contact with people in, um, you know, representatives of um, in other territories, trying to chase those things up and make sure that the, you know, things are being matched and recognized. But yes, the it is um, absolutely an area that we need to improve, but we have to be aware of the the processing times in other countries are, you know, subject to their their own systems as well. Absolutely. Okay. Completely different topic. Short film festivals. Do you get royalties for music compositions for short films if that film is being screened in in the festivals that happen? So we do not have a standard uh, distribution policy for short film festivals. Um, so we wouldn't just our standard way of doing business um, that wouldn't come through to us. Um, I would suggest that if there was evidence of music being used in a short film that was in a short film festival that we had licensed, um, we'd be looking at um, making an unlock performance claim. So yeah, um, we'll, yeah. We, uh, and an, unlocked, right. yeah, <laughs> an unlock performance claim is a whole another thing. Yeah. If you they're on our website. So if you go to the APRAMCOS website, simply search unlogged and you'll be taken to the page with information about what that's for. Basically anything that falls outside of a regular distribution on that one. So yeah. you don't want to get stuck on unlogged. Uh, yes. Yeah. Then that gives us an option, uh, um, you know, an avenue to try and, you know, look at what the, the payment should be worth and to be able to make a payment for that. So that even if it falls outside our standard processes, that we are making sure that people are recognized for the use of their music. Excellent. Okay. This was a good one. On streaming services, does a song need to... Now, streaming services, I'm going to assume we're talking about your Spotify's, your YouTube's, your Apple Music's. Mm -hmm. Does a song need to be played in its entirety to be reported? No. Nope. It um, is reported to us when it has been played for 30 seconds. So, yeah, in... Um, yeah, in the, the systems that are generally used by those guys, um, it's once it has the streamed for 30 seconds, that counts as a stream. And then it, yeah, so we don't get, they don't report to us what the duration actually was. So we don't know if someone listened to the whole song, if they listened to half of it and skipped or whatever, we don't have that level of information, but it won't register as a stream until it's been played for 30 seconds. So if someone's just listened to the first little bit and skipped, that won't come through. Once it's gone 30 seconds, it's a stream and that's the information we get. So of course, the flip side is if you don't like what Spotify recommended you, get out of there before 30 seconds. Yeah. Like, give them their 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, all righty. Now, this one I, I'm really interested to find out more about. It's regarding music recognition technology because mm -hmm. obviously we already use... Uh, that sort of technology for jingles. So if you're a jingle writer and your music is played on metropolitan radio here in Australia, you would upload the audio and we use the audio for matching. But it's been restricted to jingles up until now. Yep. I'm wondering with what you were talking about to do with community radio and the way that that's going to be changing, does this mean it's better for audio to be attached to registrations now? Are we going to start looking at ways to open that up? So at this stage, mm -hmm. I don't think that we're planning on um, starting to try and collect audio files for every single song that gets registered. Um, there will be, and we'll, yeah, I think there is a little bit of follow-up and, you know, I'll f um, find a way to get information to the, um, you know, writer reps and we can find, make sure that everyone gets the information they need. But so we have a few different um, music recognition technology suppliers. So um, yeah, we have the the jingles for um, radio and TV that goes through one supplier. We have another um, electronic and dance music dedicated um, supplier. And then we have 
uh, there's a database which is more your sort of general releases. Uh, and that's what we use. So the, the devices that we have in retail stores or gyms or hospitality, whatever, um, they use the same database that is being used by the, that we will be, um, you know, using for the community radio. Um, it's on the one hand, it's picking up all released music. So that there is, you know, anything that is released and goes via an aggregator or whatever to Apple or Spotify will then be available for matching. So that will get the metadata associated with that. Um, so you don't have to, like, as long as you've released it and it has gone out onto those online services, then it should be there and available. Um, however, I definitely acknowledge there are some people that don't necessarily want their music out there or they have different ways of releasing their music. Um, so we will make sure that we provide the information that everyone needs to um, as what path they need to follow in order to make sure that the recordings are available for that um, music recognition technology. But at this stage, I think it's more uh, information that we'll provide rather than actually, you know, us collecting the audio recordings. Okay, excellent. And so for now, jingles, if you write jingles, you're uploading audio. As for yes. whether that's assisting overseas, we couldn't really say. It would depend on the practices of the societies overseas and they not may not be using music recognition technology. But here in Australia, for metro areas, jingle writers upload your, your audio and that's how we match. Yes. Okay. And yeah, the, the yes, service right. that we use also monitors other parts of the world. So yeah, if you, when you provide us with an audio file and we then send that on, it is available when they're monitoring in other territories as well. But yeah, there are a few different service providers. And so, yeah, we can always, you know, put together a um, a bit of an information pack if if people need to know, you know, what's how do they make sure that all of their um, recordings are available to all of those different services. Excellent. Okay. Now, this was a fun one. Oh, I yes. nearly typed an answer and then I didn't. Which tier or platform pays the most per play? I'm going to assume we're talking streaming again. Yeah. Uh, can we even say? Is it a thing? So... I mean, I think that, I, look, yes. Okay. So what would you have said, by the way, Nikki? I would have said Apple. In, um, in my Google investigations, it always seems to be Apple that yeah. has a slightly higher rate. So certainly, I, well, I interpreted the question as being between the different services and it, it basically comes down to what it sort of costs. And in that regard, it's the individual subscriber because they're paying the highest. So you get a, if you have a, you know, a family plan or whatever, you're getting a discount, which means you're paying less, which means the rate, the payout rate is a bit less. Students get sort of the half price or whatever it is. Uh, it's been so long since I've been a student, I have no idea, but I think it's about <laughs> half price, which means that the, the money associated with that is lower. And then again, the ad funded is because, um, yeah, the ad revenue is much less than what people pay for subscriptions. So in that regard, the, you know, the, the individual subscriber streams are worth more. And yeah, I'm not sure whether or not, I mean, without going into great detail, I think that, yeah, Apple rates are probably a little bit higher. That's, again, Google, Google says that. Are they in, are they working together perhaps? Probably uh, all right. Competitors, but anyway. <laughs> True, Google Play, Apple, all right. Yeah. Um, there are loads of questions, so I'm just kind of, Poor Caroline is there furiously typing in the background, um, talking people talking about licensing smaller businesses. Obviously, we we try and license everyone who's using music. I mean, are we looking into blockchain? Not at the moment. I don't think so. Um, Not that I'm aware of. No. Does APRA suggest? Um, okay, so does APRA suggest that unpublished Australian writers sign up to things like Song Trust? to collect any royalties that APRA does not collect? Um, I don't think I can answer that. I didn't, um, yeah, I'm not sure that we would recommend one way or the other. It certainly doesn't come across our, um, the remit of our distribution policies. No, I'm thinking um, Song Trust is, and I always get it confused with, the other one that's in America because Song Trust, I think, is. Are you thinking of Sound Exchange? Sound Exchange. That's yeah, totally different. different. Yeah. So Sound Exchange is the recording and, Sound Song and Trust digital is the composition, right? Yeah, Sound Exchange does digital 
digital. Um, but Song Trust is separate. I, I think this is one of those questions where the answer would would probably be, look, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I think everyone really needs to do their homework and look into these sorts of things, particularly with somewhere like Song Trust, where you can. Uh, I guess one thing to talk about is just to be very aware that sometimes services like Song Trust are asking you to sign a publishing deal. Um, just be aware that when you are or, or um, possibly signing a publishing deal, they will be taking a percentage of your royalties. So as much as you might get, um, they might be. I, I just think it's a, it's a really it's hard for us to say. Yes, we would definitely recommend doing that. Um, because essentially it's uh, it's meant to be a publishing service, but whether that uh, works for your specific needs or not is another case. Yeah, pros and cons. I don't think it's our place to recommend or whatever, mm. but mm. yeah. There are so many questions. I'm just kind of reading ahead. And <laughs> so are royalties available when you go live via a platform like Instagram or Facebook? Yes, they are, is the yeah. good news. So if you are live streaming your own you know, gigs, essentially, like you're doing a live performance via Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or TikTok. We have a live stream performance report and you can claim royalties for that exactly the same way as if you were playing at a local venue, pub, restaurant, whatever that would be. So that's definitely one. Um, oh, gosh, so many. <laughs> yeah. Do you, okay, so podcasts. I, do you pay royalties for music news on podcasts? Are you able to shed light on that one, Boris? Uh, so I, I am in that we don't. Um, we, we don't have the data that is required for us to be able to match that and get a um, record of who the writers are. And you know, we, it's not reported through to us. So um, we are not able to include podcasts in our distributions. Um, this. Sorry, I'm I am trying to read through all of these and just get to the, the meaty ones because we are down to the last two minutes. Nikki, can I ask uh, you perhaps the very last one is a very simple question, which is, is the ISWC the same as an ISRC? Might be a good one just to cover quickly. Right. No, it's not. So ISRC relates to a recording. ISWC relates to who wrote it. So, for example, I get by with a little help from my friends, written by Lennon and McCartney. Um, would have one ISWC, but the Beatles recording and the Joe Cocker recording would each have an individual ISRC. And that, look at how current my musical references are. I <laughs> I wasn't born yet when either of those came out. Nevertheless, I shouldn't have to say that. Um, yeah, so yeah, ISWC is just about who wrote the song and ISRC is about who record, what artist recorded it. Fabulous. Thank you. That's great. Uh, look, there are there are so many questions here. Uh, Nikki, is there anything that you think we pluck out for now? I, I will say as well, anyone who, if we don't get to your specific question, as we had said at the start, it is very possible for you to contact us and we'll answer your questions. I would suggest shooting an email through to writer at apra.com.au if you have any questions and we will um, definitely get back to you and, and help you out. Is there any, any, any others you think we can do in 30 seconds? I don't even know if I can read all of these in 30 seconds. Um, it, there was one about do you need to supply cue sheets and audio when your music is used in a TV show, film or ad? I would absolutely suggest getting in touch and supplying that if you can. Usually a production company would supply us with the cue sheets and we should be able to, to take care of the payments for you. But if you're in doubt about that then and you have the information, you can register cue sheets with us as well. Always be proactive. If you know your music is being used, um, you know, in an overseas territory, as Derek was saying, we have that dedicated team of people who liaise with the other societies around the world. And if they know that your music is being used in certain ways, they can take the action in advance to make sure that our affiliates are looking out for that particular usage. So, yeah. Also, yeah. just on that, we can't create cue sheets ourselves. It has to be supplied to us. It has to be registered by a production company or one of our writers or whoever, a publisher. But once we have it on our system, we can provide that cue sheet to other societies. So there is a, a, um, a format we can convert it into to be distributed amongst 
um, other societies and we can then use that to claim. So definitely if you have, um, you know, written music that is in a film or TV show or whatever, and, you know, it is in your best interest as much as possible for it to be in our system because we can then use that in order to try and, um, you know, make sure that the registration has gone global, but we can't do it ourselves. So we do have to get the registration in from the copyright owner, writer, production company, whoever it happens to be. Indeed. All right. And I think um, there was one here that it seems valid. I can answer it really quickly. If you stream a gig at a pub, can you collect both royalty streams? So can you get your live performance and your live stream? The answer is no. I'm sorry. Uh, good thinking, though. Um, the one to go with is the live performance report because the rate on that one is slightly higher. So submit your live performance report. Um, I, I mean, we can wrap it up there. There are loads of great questions. If you would like the answers to these questions, as Caroline said, please do reach out to us, writer at apra.com.au. What I am going to do is just, um, oh, not put the captions on. That wasn't my plan. I was just going to pop in the links to some of our features on the website so you can find out more about our distribution and perhaps even Nikki, because what we'll do is we'll do a follow up to everybody who RSVP mm. to the event, and we'll send you out some information. So perhaps what we'll do is uh, we'll send you out some information that might be helpful to you, and we'll also send you links once we've announced those next sessions. Uh, so feel free to get back in touch with us with any of those outstanding questions as well, and we'll come back to you on that. Thank you, Derek, for coming here tonight, joining us, Thank and you, Derek. taking us through. Uh, the wilds of distribution, as I'm sure we all now have a better understanding, but also a better understanding of just how intricate it is and uh, and nuanced. Oh, so thank you, everyone. There's even joining. more intricacy and nu nuance, but, um, you know, let's leave that for another webinar. But thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you, everybody who has um, joined in. I, I do hope that it has been, um, you know, useful for you. There's lots of great responses just saying great information and thank you and great session. So uh, I think that's a thumbs up, Derek. Thank you very much. That was really, really helpful and really insightful. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, you, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll get the recording out to you as soon as we can. Thank you again. Enjoy your evening. Bye.